director of the Interdisciplinary Humanities Center. It's great to see you all here. This has been a busy week. Uh, last night we screened the film Still Alice about the early on about early onset Alzheimer's. And following the screening, we had a panel discussion that brought various perspectives in the humanities and sciences to bear upon the disease and its impact. Today, we're also going to have a conversation with a slightly different emphasis or approach. We've invited uh, some UCSD faculty members to speak about their work across multiple disciplines, both within the humanities and in the neurosciences. And we've also asked them to reflect upon the challenges uh, they are encountering and the unique possibilities as well as they pursue their interdisciplinary work. Our panel today is going to be moderated by John. John, I want to say your name right. I forgot to ask you ahead of time. How John. <laughs> John. <laughs> not Johan, not Johan. That's my uncle. Yeah, okay. Jose, no, the last. Come on. Haida. John Haida, you won't all practice, but just so when you talk to John Haida, you'll know exactly what to say. Um, John Haida is the Associate Director of the SAGE Center for the Study of the Mind. He holds a BSAB in Mechanical Engineering and Music from Stanford University. And he earned his PhD from UCLA, where he studied systematic musicology and cognitive psychology. In addition to working at the center, John teaches for the music department. So I am going to step aside and welcome John now to get our panel started, introduce our panelists. Thank you, enjoy. Bold idea to get humanists and scientists in the same room talking. It doesn't happen nearly often enough, and I'm very happy it's, it's happening today. I'd like to thank Susan and, and Emily for their, their warm welcome and for putting this together. Uh, so, the way this will work is uh, each of our panelists will, will give a 10 to 15 minute presentation of their own, giving their own insights on the issues surrounding uh, collaborative work in humanities and science. And then uh, we'll lead a discussion and see where it goes. Um, I have some ideas that I'll uh, present to the panelists and ask their feedback on, and, and then we'll, we'll open it up to the larger group as well. So um, this should be very interesting, and, and I think we're going to get a lot of new ideas out this afternoon. So our, our first panelist is uh, Julie Carlson. Many of you know her. She's a professor of English and comparative literature at UCSB, and she's the current director of uh, Literature in the Mind. She's the author, author of In the Theater of Romanticism, Coleridge and Nationalism, Women, published by Cambridge. Uh, England's first family writers, Mary Wollstone Graff, William Godwin, Mary Shelley, and co-editor with Elizabeth Weber of Speaking About Torture. Her articles have long focused on the cultural politics of the British Romantic era, with a special focus on drama and theater, and the unacknowledged legislation of poetry. Julie is currently writing a book on creativity and friendship in British Romanticism. So please welcome Julie. Thanks. Um, I understood to be speaking about my work in relation to uh, challenges, so it kind of goes back and forth. Okay. So I became interested in cognitive and neuroscientific accounts of the mind and brain. Through my participation in the specialization in the English Department on Literature and the Mind, now in its eighth year of existence, and my long standing focus on British Romanticism, the literary period, whose ruling cognitive principle is that the mind half creates what it half perceives, a principle meant to critique Enlightenment concepts of rationality in order to heighten appreciation of the transformative powers of mind. I'm primarily a student or a learner in terms of neuroscientific accounts of mind, attempting to identify and synthesize what connections I can make between brain-based and British romantic approaches to non-conscious mentation in an undergraduate course that I've devised on imagination and creativity. But in the past two years, work on the topic of improvisation that Literature and the Mind chose for its two-year investigation because of improvisation's explicit counter to dominant structures, linear and top-down thinking, and to models of creativity or genius 
that view it as isolated, individualist, or singular, helped me to formulate better what I was also after in my slowly developing book project on creativity and friendship in British Romanticism, where I was trying to hold together the importance of writing collaborations by best friends in the period, even as those friendships fractured and dissolved, with their literary and philosophical conceptions of friendship that included conceiving of books as friends. That is, what they share is the importance of relationships of being and feeling that one is in relation to create a flourishing in the arts and in the political art of living together. A point that, from in mind, was articulated in the motto of the International Institute for the Critical Study of Improvisation at Guelph, uh, that, quote, improvisation is a human right, unquote, and a mode of being that is more conducive to the achievement of human rights than rights and then reason-based concepts, and which I construe as a creative revision of the British-style French revolutionary project of being a friend to man. In other words, trying to put together notions of creativity, notions of living better together in, in terms of thinking about friendship as the hinge term. What these two very broad visionary projects share in their explicit promotion of creativity as a way to enhance openness and empathy through engagement in the arts is an underlying dynamic that cognitive and neuroscientific accounts of creative cognition elucidate and legitimate. And of course, the elucidation and the legitimation are part of what's at stake here. Because they elucidate and legitimate because of their methodological care in isolating component parts of a highly complex and still largely mysterious process, that is creativity, isolating it into traits and processes that can be studied, measured, and sometimes seen, imaged in the brain. There's two parts of this. One is the importance of surprise uh, in definitions of creativity, whether we're talking about ordinary creativity or extraordinary creativity. Uh, and thus, atten their attention to the techniques and conditions that facilitate associational and divergent thinking, the hallmark of the phase of creativity concerned with generation of ideas, and that Nancy Andreessen's early pet image studies of the brain in what she called rest, meaning random, episodic, silent thought, showed it to be precisely not resting, but as activating multiple association cortices, an observation she wrote later that, quote, lay relatively dormant, unquote, but is now a hot topic under the less ironic name of the default mode network that everybody's talking about, the network concerned with spontaneous and self-generated ideas, including mind-wandering, mental simulation, autobiographical memory, components of creativity. The other part of this dynamic uh, is acknowledgement of the deep interconnection between safety and surprise that the work of attachment theorists and evolutionary psychologists affirm, and that underscores the inherent and often precedence of emotion in thought. As John Bowlby's revisions to Freud first articulated, attachment is not a secondary gain of a primary instinct like hunger that sends a creature out into the world, but is itself a primary drive and motivation for that venturing out of creaturely life. In human creatures, this means that secure attachment is vital for mental discovery, including initially of one's own mind and of one's mind as separate from another's, and that this initial interdependence of an infant sets the cognitive template for thinking and feeling our way into whatever degrees of selfhood and independence we achieve, and that certain feeling states, like fear, anxiety, and trauma, severely limit one's capacity to think or to feel in new ways. So reading these current accounts of creative cognition, in turn, has helped me to better articulate what literary analysis contributes to the fuller comprehension and employment or deployment of this interconnection between safety and creativity, or seeking, as sometimes it's said. In my book project, 
I get at this by combining my thematic concern with the methodology that is avowedly associational by exploring the record of the fallout as friends and over the meaning of friendship between the period's most famous pairs of best writer friends, that is, William Wordsworth and Samuel Taylor Coleridge, who most people consider the most famous literary friendship ever, I mean, in the Western tradition anyway, and much less well known, but, um, but between also the radicals, William Godwin and Thomas Holcroft, that at least one critic calls the strangest friendship in the period. So this project, this part of the project, it involves from tracking terms very specific terms and circumstances, so-called biographical circumstances of their fights and their falling out, often which turn on um, right, right and misunderstandings about uh, the relation between writing, truth, fiction, and biography, which really interests me. It involves tracking these terms uh, across the different genres of their own writing from so-called um, personal writing, letters, diaries, notebooks, now of course published, but then private, and their published accounts in their fiction, but also in their fictional memoirs and lives, as the you know, lives of Brian Perdue and so on. And I do that with two larger aims again in mind. One is to demonstrate the correlation in these texts between being on the attack or defensive or on the attack or defense, with a rigidity of thinking that is visible in their recourse to categorical vocabulary, never, always, you are dead to me, <laughs> I would have died to serve you, right? Um, it's evident in the rigidity of the, these categorical terms, always and never, and in their incapacity at such moments to see, let alone acknowledge, the other's point of view. My favorite quote here is when Holcraft, when Godwin says to Holcraft, you know, you can't criticize me because when you criticize my writing, it so deflates my, you know, my, my, myself that I can't write it anymore, so you can't criticize me. But you, he says, I consider a man of iron. So, <laughs> and this, I mean, this I think is really important to think about in terms of reviewing and so on and so forth. Okay, so, um, so it's evident in that the, the correlation that I'm trying to track, which, you know, as cognitive psychologists and others talk about, between uh, threat, fear, defensiveness, and a closing down of thinking. A rigidity that their writing shows, however, to become more pliable, as a consequence not so much, although partly, as a, a, a passage of time, as of a working through of it in fiction. It is not enough to say that the process of rendering such painful experiences in fiction externalizes them in a way that grants either party distance on the passions that in the moment overwhelm them. Although this is an important part of what I'm looking at and is precisely how Godwin comes to define friend in his novel Mandeville. I have to read this quote because it really sums up what I'm trying to get at of one aspect. Where he writes, quote, no man needs a friend so much as he who is under the slavery of a domineering passion. A friend is like time, the master of us all, or like boundless space. A friend is like boundless space. He removes us to a due distance from the object, which we see falsely and distorted only because we are too near to it. I can hardly describe to my friend the thing that torments me in the wild and exaggerated way in which I view it within closed doors. What I deliver to him is really echoes so much of the cognitive work. What I delivered to him is a compounded notion made up partly of the impression I have myself entertained and partly of the temper of his mind and of my anticipation of the way in which he will regard the facts I have to relate. Unquote theory of mind, in effect, but friend. It is also, though, it's not enough to talk about this kind of externalization of passion in order to analyze it and come to terms with it. It is that by granting a, a safer space than life for the analysis of feeling, a literary work is a friend. It not just peoples, but it befriends the mind in ways that enable the mind to risk further exploration and engage with conflict. Put a different way, it befriends the mind because reading literature enhances emotional intelligence in the subtleties of things 
of its turns of phrase. In other words, again, going from rigidity to right, the kind of plurality and turnings that literature is so famous for and that often irritates people about it, but <laughs> which is for me the way we think, or one thing. In a certain respect, this enacts how the brain thinks by making connections in which thought is not because it cannot be wholly separated from affect. Moreover, literature's externalization of the internal gets re-internalized both as a memory and a feeling that narrows the distance between imagined and real experiences or among imaginary, imagined, and actual friends. So tracking the language of these fights between best writer friends then allows me to demonstrate a correlation between psychological defensiveness and narrowing of perspective, a dynamic recently underscored and complicated by a set of studies in which Matthias Boss and his team posit a dual pathway to creativity and point out that negative, negative activating moods, so it's both the hedonic and the activation of the emotion that they're focusing on, they point out that negative activating moods such as fear and anxiety, while they quote narrow cognitive categories, lower ability to shift attention, and reduce cognitive flexibility, unquote, increase persistence and perseverance, one aspect of creativity, even if they impede flexibility and spontaneity, which is the other aspect, of one other aspect of creativity, that is idea generation, the capacity to shift paradigms or domains. So that's one aspect. But reading these writers' poetic autobiographical re reflections on the growth, quote, the growth of the poet's mind, which is the famous subtitle to Words versus the Prelude, reveals, in, this is the second argument, reveals the necessity of the category friend to ongoing artistic creativity, even after the writing partnership and the personal relationship is dissolved. To take my major example here, the prelude, the 14 book, right, 14 book poem, epic poem on the growth of my mind. <laughs> well, anyway, okay. Uh, it, I think it's funny. The, pre, the prelude not only represents, quote, that summer when on Quantock's grassy hills, you in delicious words with happy heart, receiving the courage, of course, composed the ancient Mariner and Christabel, and I, quote, associate in that label. I'm sorry, later, when murmuring of the idiot boy and Martha Ray with his poems, um, as the apex of their friendship and their co-creativity, this is that summer of 1797, uh, it, it, it's the apex of their friendship and co-creativity as poets, it invokes this representation of that summer in order to thematize its ongoing presence as the instigator of ongoing poetic production. Quote, when thou dost to that summer turn thy thoughts, in speaking to Coleridge, and have before you all which then we were, to you, in memory of that happiness, it will be known, by thee at least my friend, felt, that the history of a poet's mind is labor not unworthy of regard, to thee the work shall justify itself, unquote. The passage is breathtaking in part, as critics often know, because by now, Wordsworth has removed the Ancient Mariner from its opening slot in the lyrical ballads, published the volume under his own name, and declared the state of Coleridge's mind to be hopeless. Mm. But I read something else here, similar to my reading the two ways to which this poem was referred throughout Wordsworth's lifetime. It was never named the prelude. It was published when he died, and his wife named it the prelude. But they always called it in all the letters and so on either the poem on the growth of my mind, the poem on the growth of his mind, and others are referring to it, and the poem to Coleridge. So I read that as the underlying message and lasting inspiration of this. Friend, that is, repeatedly invoked throughout this 14-book epic, is partially fatty, just keeps saying, oh friend, oh friend, just to get the thing going, because you know, he's often talking about writer's block and the, and the sort of blockage in uh, um, ongoing creativity, the power to, to write, um, and largely or partly imaginary, Coleridge as friend or the other oh friends who are unnamed. And the conjuring, because the conjuring of the presence of friend brings into
the mind and other for whom the writer's words are known to have value. That's what he's saying. You alone, for your ears only. You uh, will value, the, the, my words will have value, meaning, significance, and thus about whom this other, the poet, is, quote, unapprehensive of scorn and reproof. In other words, friend is the one to whom one does not have to explain oneself, and thus to whom one is inclined to tell everything. Put a different way, this friend is imaginary, is precisely not another mind, which for these writers is key to ongoing creativity. Accepting this makes friend part of the default network associated with spontaneous and self-generated mentation, while also complicating what is input from without or within. But the merger of the mind-brain that is said to occur in the eureka moment of poetic collaborations, the two are, are eureka-izing, <laughs> knowledge of which so far depends wholly on subjective accounts, of course, of two minds that say they feel like they become one, but also a third. It's a boon for the generation of even more novel connections, but it presents difficulties for the lived experience of friends. And this is a different argument with uh, romanticism. But in this regard, uh, social psychologist Michael Farrell's 2008 book called Collaborative Circles, Friendship Dynamics and Creative Work, that outlines their six stages, raises two points that again help clarify what I see these writers contributing to the discussions, or my discussion, if I have the interrelation theirs, between creativity and friends. One is his finding that for the central stage of what he calls quest creative work, which is the activation of divergent thinking that then coalesces into the so-called creative breakthrough, group members, because he's talking about collaborative circles, group members pair off into two sets. The moments of discovery, quote, the collaborative moments take place when a pair of friends are so open and trusting with one another that they can share their wildest, most tentatively held ideas. They draw on one another's memories, ideas, and thought processes operating almost as one mind. This is, of course, stage three in the model that Ben just goes on in his account to collective action, disintegration, and reunion. But what, I'm, what the writers I study foreground is that the process of re-individuation is neither natural, nor easy, nor smooth. And in their writings, friend names a lasting connection that is not simply nostalgic or a fantasy because it generates a recollected, mentalized affect, that is, receptivity, non-reproof, from which creative ideation is more likely to occur. Moreover, this friend can be a text, a creature, or a person. What matters is that the attachment feels secure. So underlying these remarks are just two final methodological observations that I hope help to characterize the relation between the humanities and neurosciences as a precondition, perhaps, to enhancing it. As brain-based creatures, we care to know and have to care to know. This does not distinguish scientific from humanistic method whereby science cares to know, I mean, cares to know, and the humanities know to care. So much as it, used, it usefully, I think, distinguishes within each discipline curiosity from what the Romantics called sympathetic curiosity, or in more current terms, an ethic of care. Speaking from the humanities, it's clear that literature has fueled both modes of curiosity, um, fueling sadism, cruelty, inhumanity to others, as well as capacity to empathize, see from another's perspective, forge unforeseen connections. <coughs> Identification with fictional characters is one means of enhancing the latter, but more fundamental, I think, is enactment of this forging in poetic devices like metaphor and simile, and the cognitive metaphor and simile is a lot about this, like metaphor and simile, whose literal bringing into consciousness of before unapprehended connections between persons things, changes conscious perceptions and unconscious ways of perceiving. This is a different way to characterize the emotional intelligence that literature offers. Through its modes of mental transport and analysis of the mind-brain, literature offers the opportunity not only to know the difference between these types of curiosity, but also to stay more open to the sound of surprise. And the second observation is institutionally interpersonal. Conditions of trust, as 
establish conditions of knowledge formation and the reformation of disciplinary divides. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm going to steal some of your ideas. <laughs> I can't wait. Uh, Scott Grafton is recognized for developing multimodal brain mapping techniques combined with state-of-the-art bioengineering methods for accelerating discovery and diagnosis of the nervous system. He is co-director at the Institute for Collaborative Biotechnologies, which draws on bio-inspiration and innovative bioengineering solutions for both non-medical and medical challenges posed by the defense and medical communities. He is a technology integrator and directs a research program at the interface of network science, control, and dynamical systems sensor fusion, and multimodal imaging. He received his MD from the University of Southern California and completed residencies in neurology at the University of Washington and in nuclear medicine at UCLA. As a research fellow at UCLA, he developed fundamental, method, fundamental methods for mapping human brain activity and studied brain plasticity during learning and health reorganization in the face of injury. He developed brain imaging programs at the University of Southern California, Emory University, and Dartmouth College. He joined the UCSB faculty in 2006 and directs the UCSB Imaging Center. He uses fMRI, magnetic stimulation, and high-density EEG to characterize the neural basis of goal-directed behavior with an approach grounded in 20 years of clinical experience. Scott, please come forward. Mine's going to be a little more electronic. Uh, uh oh, we need a password for this. Um, right, so I'm a scientist. I know nothing about humanities from a formal academic perspective. But as a clinician, I can tell you that uh, what patients want is they want to feel and they want to move and they want to have a resonance with the world. It's, they want to interact with the world. And so, my, my narrow view into this space is really about how, how people create some kind of resonance or feeling interaction uh, with others in particular. Um, our work was very austere. It was really focused on movement, action control, brain systems, basically treating us as if we were robots and the thing that we can make a, a robot work, right? Uh, and, then, and then what happens, the way you really get the humanities and the sciences to work is you get graduate students in your lab who, who are essentially humanists. And they just start slipping in uh, interesting questions and experiments. And before you know it, you're doing things you never thought were possible. Like, uh, what are the fundamental brain structures that underscore um, just our compulsive desire you know, to, to train to any kind of rhythm whatsoever. And one measure of beat, we're already in there in the group, right? Amazing stuff. Uh, that's sort of, that was one whole spark of creativity in our group. Um, another is, um, you know, uh, what is it about the way we work together to learn new skills? Uh, you know, watching someone else, that enables us uh, to accelerate the way we're going to learn itself. So somehow we can template, template physical movements and other into our own movements and rapidly accelerate skill. And this is, this is a core aspect of both uh, just learning new skills as well as uh, creating uh, creative moments. Uh, so I've got a lot of fun videos. So this was one of our first studies. I'm going to show you a basically sliding into the heart of darkness here. Uh, <laughs> This was sort of an innocent start. It was like, okay, you're going to learn to dance. And you're going to have to do Dance Dance Revolution. And as you learn this, how do your representation do the brain change? And if you learn to do this watching others, how does that make your representation start to feel? The best part about this was we got a lot of Dartmouth students who were otherwise couch potatoes. But a lot of this was around sequence learning, body movements, you know, feeling quality is uh, pretty sparse. 
but also the guys that are involved in the direction of how can you use uh, the physicality of body movements to understand some of these core questions about uh, physical resonance. We move body movement, we move together, we think there's a connection in that. Forward. It's crazy, right? It's very synchronous, complex. This goes on for 40 minutes, this dance. So this is a 
big project. And the neat thing was all the dancers said, yeah, scan my brain. Scan it beginning, scan it at the end. You have to think of all the control conditions you want to include, dances that you've seen, other new dances you've seen other people practice just as much as you have in the body. And just as we saw before, these key brain areas sort of unpack the world and unpack the movement. You know, so these uh, progressive changes as you acquire the skill. You see people, you know, essentially mapping the world differently as their physical experiences uh, form. And they relate to their competencies. So the better they are actually as dancers, as learning the pieces, the more that the more that tracks with these changes in the brain. That was, that was really exciting for us. And um, it, these kinds of studies have stood the test of time. And there's been a lot of debate in the literature. What is it in the brain? What is it doing? Like, what, is, what are those little orange bits doing? Um, the original premise was it's simulation. For me to understand what you're doing, I have to take that information in and then play it through my own motor system as a simulator to be able to decode what you're doing. And uh, it's an appealing idea, right? Uh, I have that physical kind of motor plan in there. I put what you're doing up against it and do they match and if they do, that's, that's uh, what you're doing. Uh, it's probably not what you do at all. To make a long story short, that's too slow, too complicated, too fuzzy. It doesn't work if I've never done the action or anything close to the action. We probably instead use these systems um, to both guide our attention to really evaluate what that person's doing, but more importantly, we use these to predict what the person's going to do next. So if I know what they're doing, and I can resonate with that, I can make really powerful predictions about where you're going in the future. So maybe that relates to creativity and surprise and things like that. I don't know, but it's not as big. But the point is, you use these resonant circuits not to be code, but to predict the future. So I wanted to just close with one other line of work we've done here. That again, it was, you do these studies by the students, you say, well, why don't we look at people feel when they see other people? Here we've been looking at sort of just the mechanics of movement, the technical aspect. You know, when I see your body language, you know, how do I think your body language? You know, are there special brain areas that decode body language? There's all this real work on this. Um, and so, you know, here, let's just do a couple experiments. How does this person feel? She's got a mask on, so you can't cheat by looking at her facial expression. Right? Now, I'm giving you, I'm giving you easy choices to come on that. Make it easy for you, right? But you get the idea. It's, it's a seven second video. You can totally, you know, zoom in on, on, on that person's mental state. The way we did this study was we got the local uh, the Montecito dance tree. Literally, they just took, me, took words out of a hat, single word, emotional states, just read them. So just go on the dance floor, two cameras, film, just improvise. And in some cases, they said, well, I'm going to do what, you know, like classic gestures, like if you're angry or something like this, and we all kind of immediately kind of know from the area. And then, and then they also did stuff I'm going to be really abstract. You gotta make it harder for me, but, but still try to carry the emotional state. So I've got a couple of words just to just look at. Um, such great people. Okay, so that's just one example. Okay, so boom, right? Seven seconds. You're already in, in her mind, theory of mind, theory of everything, right? You, it was a great sense of what that person states. <laughs> um, <laughs> too much. Ah, uh, um, here's one more. All oh, <laughs> So you know, we have hundreds of these now, and, and so you can create a whole library of them, like, uh, an emotional space that is essentially a touch, but this is, you know, this is the essence of humanity is feeling, right? And so we can look into the brain and what are the areas that decode these emotional states? And it's 
you know, on the one hand, it's really satisfying, the other is kind of boring. It's like, oh yeah, there's a, there's a blob in your brain that does this, right? Places in the cheek food. It come from somewhere, right? But then, you know, it's a stuff, right? When you make these maps, it's like, oh, now I understand how this works. No, you say, well, there's a, there's a, this place is particularly sensitive to the, the emotional state, how the social is moving, moving. And then you can start bringing, what else do we know about this area? You sort of create just those stories, but that's what you do when you're getting inside. And then that allows you to build deeper models. And in this case, what's particularly interesting about this is two things. One is in the right side of the brain. You don't see this stuff on the right side of the brain. And just in, in the simplest terms, prosody, emotional content, whether you're producing it or understanding it, it's heavily weighted towards the right side of the brain. Classic patients with strokes who can the left side of the brain, they can talk or understand speech. The right side of the brain, they can talk, but the emotional content is going to speak in one So that's one interesting thing. The other is that it's in this particular lobe of the brain in that particular spot. We're working with people at um, UCSF, um, Maria Gorni Tempin, who studies um, patients with semantic dementias. So these are very particular kind of uh, dimensions and when they occur in this part of the brain, so when you get to generations in this part of the brain, she has a sudden set of patients who are particularly impaired in understanding emotional content and they don't state of other people. And then it's a progressive kind of dimension. That, but that's one of the first vulnerabilities to have. So we've been working with her using these kind of videos as another way of understanding what's going on. So, so that's how you do it in science. You sort of come up with these quirky experiments, you get some preliminary data, you adjust those stories, and then you start reaching that trend. So that's all I have to say today. <laughs>
I think um, I think it begins very early. I mean, I think that's an optimistic thing to say, Scott, that uh, your students are um, getting titrated away from humanities by the time they're already grad students and postdocs. I think it happens much earlier than that. Um, you know, maybe in high school or grade school, when some kids get introduced to uh, molarity or Avogadro's number or something, and suddenly science becomes become a frame of science. And um, so, and they should because you know unless you're doing string theory or something really abstruse, science is just not that uh, much of an obstacle. It's really no, definitely no harder than reading Ulysses. Um, <laughs> so it's um, so there is this uh, fear of science that uh, has to be overcome in the humanities. In science, the problem is very different. In science, the trouble with scientists is that they're bored with the humanities. They have not discovered the power, the beauty, the in reason why the humanities are so compelling. It just has escaped scientists, and I think we all have to do a better job to, for scientists to um, understand why uh, the humanities are important. So that's what I'm going to talk about today. I'm going to talk about the idea that um, if you want to be a scientist, the best training you can have is in literature. And uh, I think uh, you, know, you can get all the training you want as a high school student or a college student in chemistry and biology, but by the time you start doing it, it's going to be all different. It's, literature is not going to be different. It's going to stay the same, and it's not just going to stay the same, but what you learn is going to apply to much more closely to what is going to ensue in your career. So how does that work? I'm going to um, go through a few items of why I think a scientist should learn humanities and what they get from it. And um, the first one is just obvious. The first one's an absolute platitude. I'm almost ashamed to say it. It's just that you know you learn to write. To scientists uh, really are not known for their writing style. It's uh, it's dry. It's often uh, agrammatical. It just has a lot of problems, and uh, it hasn't always been that way. If you read Darwin or you read uh, Santiago Cajal, uh, Ramon Cajal. It, you know, you can see beautiful, beautiful writing in scientists, uh, but uh, it's no longer quite that way. There's very few scientists that are uh, that write well, and even if they try to write well, it gets edited out in the journals because that's not the way you're supposed to present data. Um, the um, but the, the the reasons for doing humanities are much deeper than that, and um, so one of them is is that. The, the themes of literature are really what scientists increasingly have to contend with. Um, I'll just give another one that's relatively obvious. It's, uh, you know, ethics is just, uh, is, is occur as a problem in science all the time, and increasingly so. Now we can manipulate genes and manipulate embryos and put genes into embryos and decide if they're going to you know, uh, grow up with stem cells. And there's just, um, all kinds of things in which scientists are have to make ethical decisions, and yet we know that literature, it's a major theme in literature, is struggling with ethics. And the way, uh, and the reason that the, the gap is that the scientists are ultimately going to have to make a decision. You have to decide, you know, do you really want to manipulate the genes in the germline of an embryo so that not only is that embryo with different genes, but its offspring will also have different genes is a big question that's happening today in the sciences. Um, but you know, in, 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 so literature does not really make judgments like that. There's no decision that has to be made. You simply you know, present this problem in a novel, and you can see that uh, you know, somebody, like in uh, the story, story of Dostoevsky about killing someone um, who is very old and has some money that this younger guy could use, you know, there's these ethical problems that come out. Uh, you know, see this in Shakespeare. All oh, it, it is all for literature, where we make the judgment. The reader makes the judgment, and uh, that is really valuable because that's ultimately what has to happen. We all have to make individual decisions about whether a person thinks that abortion should happen or not happen, whether or not a person can take their own life to when they have a terminal illness or not. These are very highly personal decisions which have been enacted already on a literary stage. So I think that's, that's one thing that's really important. Another thing is, is that 
Uh, and Scott alluded to this a little bit. A scientist has to learn how to tell a story. A, a person in the arts knows how to tell a story. That's, that's what they do. You know, in a lab, we don't get stories. We do an experiment, and there it is. You, you, know, you saw some pictures from Scott. It's a few areas of the brain lit up. In my lab, we do more molecular biology. We see some, we, we see things. We, we, do, we run what's called gels, which proteins separate. You see the band there. And you say, oh, wow, that band looks cool. looks interesting. But why is it interesting? What is it that is actually, what's the story behind it? And uh, the story is not necessarily, just like in literature, it's not a sequential story. There's no predetermined timeline. You never, a good scientist never tells the story of their work in the order in which they did it. They, don't, they never say, that's what's in their lab notebook. Day one, I did that. In, in science, you might tell the end before the beginning and then you backtrack. You have to mix it up to convey your story really well. And the best scientists take their data and mold it into a story. That is every bit of story like literature is a story. It has its flaws, it has its shortcomings, it has uh, a climax, it has a denouement. It has all of these aspects to it that are all taken from the literature. And um, so telling a story is a very big piece. Um, the, another thing about science that uh, our scientists have to learn from literature is, is that um, you know, people in the arts know how to depict their, um, know how to express themselves within certain constraints. You know, Shakespeare had to use iambic pentameter. It was, he had to get across brilliant, brilliant ideas, but do it within the rhythm of a line, deciding to rhyme, not rhyme. There's always a, there's a constraint. Well, in science, we also have to have constraints. We have constraints of our methods. We have constraints of how we can present data. We have to take these constraints and use them, operate within them, to express something that's grand. And that is, again, another, I think, another very big, um, crossover. Um, there is um, uh, uh, the, um, uh, another one of those enumerated points here, and they don't necessarily follow in some logical way. Um, um, in, in psychology particularly, but actually in a lot of science, what scientists are looking for is the midpoint on the bell-shaped curve. And artists are looking for the outliers. Now, that is a really big difference because scientists often go wrong by only looking at the mean, at the average, at what sits in the middle of the bell-shaped curve. Because in pharmacology, for instance, if you give a drug to somebody, it may work in one person and not work in another. The pharmaceutical companies love a one-size-fits-all because then they can sell drugs to lots of people. But actually, that's not how human bodies work. We all work on a range, and there are always outliers, no matter what we talk about. There's always a range. And this one-size-fits-all, thinking of only studying the mean, is a complete misconception of the way the world works. And artists know that. In fact, artists are a little bit bored with the mean. They really are interested in the weird stuff that's really way out there. And if scientists understood that better, it's like, really, what do we learn from, the, from nature's exceptions? We learn from that rare mutation that just happens to have some syndrome that looks a lot like autism, and now that mutation gave us the lead into the disease, the hook, that let us learn about the condition. So we, we need to pay more attention to the exceptions. We need to pay more attention to outliers. Um, and um, that's something that artists are very comfortable with. And um, I think one um, last point I'll make, which is for a reason that scientists um, really have to get a total version of the humanities to do their work well, is um, another idea that artists are comfortable with, but scientists are not. And that is the idea that uh, two opposite things can both be true. It is not a problem for any artist. You know, the good guys, the bad guys, and you know, it's, 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 it's all the time that happens. It's not, it's, it's not even discussed. It's just like, wow, that's an interesting, ironic turn in the 
story. But uh, scientists want to find something that's only true in one way. That it's you know, it's either black or white. It's not ever anything in between, and it's not both things at the same time. But usually that's how things are. So um, you know, in my field of Alzheimer's disease, there's a, one this this uh, structure in the brain called neurofibrillar entanglement, and uh, it's made up of a protein that you just it's so insoluble. You just put it in any like strong acid, it won't dissolve. But the protein from which it's made is highly soluble, just like with salt and water, it dissolves. And this is a property of a protein that has two opposite characteristics, and it's the same thing. It just completely changes its nature when it goes into the Alzheimer's complete opposite. So having a certain comfort level with things that are diametrically opposite and also both true is another area in which scientists could benefit from humanists that have no trouble with that concept whatsoever. Um, so I'll stop there. I think um, I said all my notes already. Um, and that's it. Thank you. We have time. We have time. Great. So perhaps our panelists would like to come forward. And um, 
but the idea is that um, you frame questions in a way that you can study in a scientific fashion, and the scientific methodology takes over. Um, the uh, idea of operational definition is different in science than it is in the humanities. And operational definition, um, I remember I was at the Musicology Forum a few years back in the music department, and people were arguing over uh, what was the term? Hybridity. Okay, great work. And they were looking at different examples of uh, musical cultures mixing and saying, is this an example of hybridity or not? And I raised my hand and said, well, why don't you just come up with an operational definition of hybridity? You know, I got this look like I was Frankenstein. Um, but so to use a, a simpler term in musicality, say, I don't know, tonality, maybe it's a term. If, if any of you have music lessons, you know about tonality. And how do you define it? Well, there are lots of ways. The scientist says, for the purposes of this experiment, this is how I'm defining it. Do re fa so latino, or a chord progression, or whatever the case may be. And that's how I'm going to establish tonality. If you don't like how I, my operational de definition, you can come up with your own. You can replicate what I've done, change the definition, see if the results change. If they change, that's great. We've learned something. We've actually collaborated, even though we're miles apart. That's how it kind of works in science. In the humanities, yeah. Maybe not so much. Maybe they'll spend more time arguing over what's tonality and what's not. Is tonality established? Is it not? Where is it ambiguous? Um, then um, the big difference is, is, of course, in the experimental world. Scientists go into places called laboratories, and they're separate from the real world, right? Um, not always, but oftentimes they are. Certainly, in the work I've done with music perception and cognition, uh, you know, I'm bringing people into a room, sitting in front of a laptop, listening to some kind of musical snippets and making judgments about them. Not really the way most people experience music, whether they're making it or just appreciating it, okay? So there is definitely uh, a difference between the experimental world that I create and the real world of music. And in fact, probably the best thing I could do is to draw a dotted line from that experimental world at the bottom to the world of music. Um, there is an assumption, I'll, I'll, I hate to use the word leap of faith, but there's kind of a leap of faith that whatever I'm learning in this experimental world, this laboratory, actually has some bearing on the real world, okay? That's something that a lot of scientists don't like to admit, okay? So this issue, getting back to Ken said about, you know, the scientists kind of searching for the truth, I have, that's my take on, on the truth. Um, as a scientist, when I'm pretending to be one, um, I don't really think I'm searching for truth. Um, I think that what I'm doing is trying to work within this wheel uh, to come up with models, that, getting back to what Scott said about how um, we evaluate things and we predict. That's, I think, a really fundamental mode of human existence, whether it be an aesthetic experience or otherwise. Um, that evaluation and prediction is constantly going on. That's how we decide if we like something or not. Um, if we cannot make any predictions about what's going on, it's chaotic, get me out of here, I don't know, I don't understand. If I understand enough that I can predict some things, but you can surprise me, well, I want more. If it's so predictable that I've been there, I've done that, I've seen this movie a thousand times, I don't want to deal with that either. Okay, so, uh, in, the, in the, the world of scientific research, it kind of goes the same way, right? We, we build our bodies of knowledge, we analyze our data, uh, which is often in some kind of numerical format, which also scares humans. And uh, we decide whether our hypotheses are confirmed or disconfirmed. In the scientific world, we don't get published. If our hypotheses are disconfirmed, that that can be useful, helping us redesign our experiments. And eventually, we build some kind of theory, some kind of big model of what's basically prediction in life. And Scott and Kennedy have different takes on this, but I think this is basically uh, how, how a lot of scientific uh, research works. Um, so um, the gap that, that they can talk about um, is very large and for a lot of reasons, but I think that there's um, a lot of place for these two areas to be brought together because, um, like I said, in, in, the initial questioning or, or desire to learn something about the real world, that's common ground, okay? And um, even though, you know, we get lost in terms of the jargon and the way we, we, the way we present ourselves, 
we can always go back to the common ground. Um, there's the idea that there's a scientific lab and people bring humanistic approaches into the scientific lab. Uh, there's the idea that there's a humanistic, humanistic project and we can bring scientific ideas to shed light on these uh, questions that we're still basically approaching from humanistic methodology. What I'm wondering is, can we really bring the two together, right? Um, and obviously I believe the answer is yes, because I happen to live in both worlds. I have degrees in music, I have degrees in mechanical engineering. Um, I decided to, to go for the big bucks and get a PhD in music, but um, that was a joke. <laughs> and, and, but, but, but both worlds can not only coexist, but, but actually work together. And ultimately they'll have to, I think Ken was kind of getting at this, to, uh, to solve important problems. Um, it's, you can't just have folks doing only humanities, folks doing only science and expect to solve the problems of the world. Both are going to have to understand each other and you know, get past, while I talk in PowerPoint, while I talk in the presentation and get past that and really talk to, and really work together. So the question is, what are ways to make that happen? Um, I'll turn it over to the panelists as, just, as a kind of precursor and ask for any impressions you have on, on either each other's presentations or what, I, what I've said at this point. Um, we can start with Laura and Scott if you want to say a few words, and please move the mic over. Well, it's always good to learn from mistakes. Uh, so there's, there's a really interesting period, uh, maybe five years ago, where uh, vision scientists uh, got really interested in aesthetics. It gets a little scary because it's almost like a eugenics question. Like you say, okay, uh, I'm going to show a monkey different pictures of art and uh, record from visual neurons and identify those neurons that are more sensitive to aesthetically pleasing images. Which is it's really cool, because right at the heart of like, how does the brain represent you know, features that you find beautiful. Mm -hmm. And people are doing this with imaging as in humans as well. You show, uh, you know, you show subjects paintings and see which ones they like more, or you try to guess which ones they're going to like more, uh, just by looking at the brain into it. So it's, it's um, but it's, it's, I don't know why I'm dwelling on it, maybe just, just, I think you can, you can convince yourself you're doing something really important in combining these things, but mm -hmm. end up essentially, uh, who's to say what the, you know, the, the space of aesthetics is really complicated and I think, you know, uh, trying to, to come up with sort of canonical or the things that, in the mean, you know, that, that explain how a brain understands aesthetics have to be really, really hard and yet for people, you know, people are doing that and they say, well, this is, this, you know, these are the areas that decide what true beauty is in your brain. Mm -hmm. What the is that? Okay. Mm -hmm. so, I do use PowerPoint. I thought about it, but I didn't this time. Um, yeah, I mean, I guess for me, I mean, a couple things. One is what I was trying to both think about and enact in that sort of, you know, immersion and then stepping above is. So a kind of integration, I mean, in a certain way, between what one might call a scientific approach, I mean, it wasn't scientific, I don't mean that, but where you try to delimit and make clear what your terms are in this moment, <laughs> at the same time that I need to then flip it into something that resonates, in order to use your term, but I mean linguistically, with multiple possibilities and meaning systems. And to me, that would be really one way that I think the dialogues could be really more productive. And one of those distinctions then would also be whether we're talking about, when we're talking about 
and again, you can't, you know, humanists never feel comfortable with any of these distinctions, but, but between sort of intellectual categories and institutional ones, I mean, which is what I was trying to talk about a bit at the end. And so there are these ways in which the humanities are, or let's just say literature right now, is, you know, is, is certainly interested in studies of the mind and what, you know, seeing it in the brain helps us to actually be able to better explain, I think is part of the point, about these structures like empathy and the belief in what literature can do in terms of solving large problems. But it's often also motivated by institutional pressures which are saying that the humanities don't know anything, you know, empirical, and so we now can point to something in the brain and feel feel like we're saying something. And I'm, I struggle with that, you know, because, you know, first of all, A, I'm, I'm too old to really do that. I mean, you know, in the sense of, like, I just want to say we're writing a search right now in cognitive literary studies in English, and these people are doing this. I mean, the four people we brought are really working in medical labs, but doing the qualitative analysis of patient transcripts, or doing, you know, working in neuroscientific labs that are imaging reading processes, and so on. So I mean, other people, it will happen, I think. But I think part of it right now, I would want to at least distinguish between what are the vocabularies that help each of us understand better, you know, aesthetics from a scientific point of view, or literature. Uh, in science from a literary perspective, and those pressures within America or the world, but also the university, whereby humanities needs to legitimate itself. And, and part, of what, part of how we're doing that is being able to say, right, that we are in dialogue now with, with science. And I mean, I, I'm not against it. I just mean those are two different interrelated enterprises that, you know, because the question would be, and certainly of course I agree with what, what you were saying about what literature does and why, you know, science or anybody should want to be reading. <laughs> um, but you're the only one saying that. Really. I, I mean, you're, I mean, you're not the only one, but I mean, are you, you know, would you say that's primarily because you were an English undergrad or, I mean. Yeah. Um. I don't know why I always tell students that why is not our question. We, we would wonder how things happen. You know, I, I don't know why. I, I know that, um, uh, I, I, but I do firmly believe that it's very important. Right? And I think that, um, you know, what you mentioned and you guys mentioned a little bit is um, this idea about integration. I don't mean to be a contrarian, but I'm not sure if it's really integration. I think what we're really trying to figure out here is how, um, humanists can help scientists be better scientists, and how scientists can help humanists be better humanists. Yeah, because to total, total integration is just is not the goal. It's your different fields. Yeah. It's not going to be ever be really integrated. I mean, I don't know, you can represent uh, aesthetics and show where the brain lights up, but you're not, I don't think you're ever going to be able to understand why it is that you get this, like, just a whole wave of emotion when you look at some, you know, a painting or a piece of poetry. I don't know that that is something that is even, um, you know, it's not necessarily an answerable question. It may not even be that interesting of a question for a scientist. Um, it's not the question we ask. So I, I think um, it's really, um, so integration might not be the goal. The goal really is so how these fields can talk to each other more and help the two fields be better at what they already do. So I like what you said about health workers and multiple perspectives. And it, was, it occurred to me while you were talking that something that's interesting that's happened in science around HIV is the idea, which seems to me like an imaginative leap, that's something that we had assumed from a public health perspective on a scientific one was about attacking the immune system might be have efficacy and value in an approach to um, cellular changes or approaches to cancers. That, I mean, that's a recent, recent development. I find it really interesting. But it almost strikes me like that's almost, that's the outlier approach. You know, that's the imaginative leap that we're familiar with in the humanities that actually 
that possibly the mean way of looking at something, the middle way of looking at something in the sciences might not have ever come to. I'm not sure this makes sense. Um, yeah, I, I think it's another very nice example of uh, how those mental leaps are just so important, and the really clever scientists are the ones that can make those leaps. Um, and they may do it because of their endogenous ability or their scientific training or the fact they took a humanities course, I don't know. <laughs> question um, for you, Scott. So I'm wondering about the, what I think was the kind of progression of your presentation. And <coughs> if I understood it, and I didn't understand all of it, you began with the question that I think would draw any human being in. And I think it was, Sort of the question of how people create healing interactions with others. That's what I heard. So keep nodding if this is accurate. And then it moved to the question of a, a more limited perception. Does physical embodiment change the way I see? Okay, so. And then what I think what's happening is the subject, the, the human in her totality, started to slip away or get concretized. And then it became a question of uh, mapping, how we map the world, the brain maps the world different as physical knowledge changes. And then suddenly, what I felt was happening was that the how became a that. It is that we map the world differently. And I suddenly lost the first question, which was how we create feeling interactions, and it's related to the way we perceive the body's movements, depending upon whether we have a bodily experience. But it got uncoupled from the feeling interaction. So the, the totality of the person slipped away, and with it for me, the passion behind the question, for me. I didn't, you know. Welcome, I, welcome to the thumb roll of science. Okay, you know, so wait, but then, Yeah, because you basically, you, you operationalize, you break it down, but, and then you look at bits, right? But, but, but you're cool losing, for me, so, I mean, then it finally came down to an interesting localization that it replaced embodiment. What are the areas of the brain that we see where we can see this this transaction happening, and then there was almost for me nothing else to say. We were in, and then I thought, well, okay, so what? Meaning, and I don't mean that glibly. What do we now? We have a place, and it's not like the end of the story. But what happened to the story? And I wanted to know what happens when you jumped out of an airplane, and and then see it happening. What happens? Why does it matter? that experience and how does it change the way we move in the world? Do we have to live everything in order to have empathy to come back to Julie's question or one of them? So I'm just wondering, and then, you know, what you said, Ken, was really, it's the, um, you pointed to the way literature is always looking at, you call them outliers or exceptions, but it's every, in literature, everything, but every, every moment or every, every embodied, you know, character becomes an outlier or an exception because you're studying that person and that person is inimitable, is, is unique. And, you know, just to sort of the specificity creates something that can't be repeated. Or, you know, Julie, I would want to ask you, you, you could start talking about how to understand this process of creativity. You have to really understand the logic or, or path of every specific metaphor. The turns of language can't be generalized, right? I mean, that it turns, that figure turns can be, but to feel it has to be an experience or to see it, right? In, in reading, that's what reading would do, a kind of reading. So I'm not sure, I'm just wondering what gets lost in, the, in those steps that you said, welcome to science, sort of science, you know, sort of cynically. What happens to your questions? And, why in the world would you be bored with literature? But, I mean, or can, does literature help 
keep the, the, the questions that you begin with, literature, humanities, whatever we want to call it, alive to you? Is, is that, it's not a question, but it's my response. <laughs> <laughs> um, so take a question like, okay, how is the brain created? How are you going to approach that from a neuroscience standpoint? Cognitive neuroscience is a really hard problem. And uh, if you just put someone in a scanner and say, be creative, it's, it's silly, it's right, right? And so, you know, it's like we're circling around these questions and kind of making stabs at experimental approaches and start to unpack some of the underlying processes that seem to be important. And I'd say that's, that's kind of the, the examples that we're giving were just different ways you can do that through the space of movement. I don't say, I don't claim we're at the end point. We, I, we don't understand how, how you truly share a feeling with someone else in physical motion. But at least we're getting a parts list. And that's how you start to so like, build a parts list and hopefully you can start making sense out of it. Mm -hmm. But it's not like, I mean, I can't, I can't go and say, well, this is, I think just to do uh, you know, sort of a mental experiment here, if you had every single component of the parts list, you know, we can now sequence every single nucleotide, all three billion of them in each one of us, and they're all different. So we have all the, we have every, so we're all outliers, and it's all our genes are different. And uh, then we go even further and we look at every single neuron in the brain, and there's some synapses in there, there's a billion neurons, and you know, multiply that by 5,000 to get all the synapses in the brain, and then convert all that to the equations, everyone has to define all that stuff, you still don't get the feeling. You still don't get it. That's why I say it's not the goal of science. I mean, I think Scott said it right. He says, you know, we're finding what's important. We're finding where the problems are that may be able to help people that aren't, you know, maybe sick, may have some problems. But there's no uh, way that all of this entire parts of this, this whole complex edifice that the scientists are building is ever going to do what literature does for us? I think what I was trying to, to do, both in talking specifically about the category of trend, but more generally, is certainly, yes, I mean, you know, literature is based, or certainly part of what it thinks it's doing, its particularity, right? And so I was at times trying to get above that to say something more general about what I think it's trying to affect. But even in terms of the term, phrase, a metaphor, simile, example I was giving, it's less about, yes, I mean, on one level, yeah, every term phrase is different from another, and especially inserted in one area that's different from another. More what I was trying to get at is ways in which that process of bringing it to consciousness through literature helps us have a model for different forms of unconsciousness which I think is one of the big discoveries, you know, of brain imaging. I mean, that, that is different from psychoanalysis, but nonetheless has now given, again, legitimacy to the notion of how much of what we do in the brain is unconscious. So I was, I was, and, and certainly the sort of humanist, but also still in science, you know, scientific notions of creativity are always about this kind of breakthrough that comes from somewhere, you know, that's bubbling up in the unconscious. So I was trying to get at that dynamic by talking about the ways both literary enact, I mean, literary writers in romanticism theorize, say, uh, a, a trope-like simile, which for me, especially with Shelley, is really important for exactly enacting the unconscious aspect of surprise that then gets brought into consciousness. This is like that, which can be heavy-handed, but on another level for, for Shelley, it is about a kind of forging for consciously of the before un uh, the before unacknowledged uh, relations between things that is key for him to both the new surprise and empathy and and so what I'm trying to get at is that is right. modeling and, and and the sort of cognitive accounts of in their you know they you know they try to separate parts of creativity rightly you know from 
divergent thinking to the convergence to insight to whatever. And, and, then, and then in relation to kinds of states of mood and the level of activation of any particular mood. And so that all gets particular, but I'm, you know, right, I, I'm really thinking this helped me try to formulate more uh, explicitly how to talk about unconscious innovations in literature, but that literature then brings to consciousness right. sometimes as thematized, like in when he says a friend is this, but at, at other times, like in the prelude, it's not thematized. I'm reading it by reading, by tracing the right. vocabulary of friend to this larger point about, for at least Wordsworth, the sort of both imaginary and static necessity of a friend that is a, an other, an audience to whom your words you can imagine are going to be wanted and heard. And, and I think that has enormous implications. That's, what I, that's the sort of more universalizing claim I was trying to make. For writer's block, for what we're doing when we're talking, I mean, if, if you think it, no one wants to hear you, or even you know, on this panel where I was, it was hard for me to write this because I was worried. You know, I don't know the science. So, you know, what does, you know, when anxiety is where you're writing from, it, it differs. So it, it, was trying to, it was trying to talk about the ways that the kind of very close analysis of literature that sometimes gives us a bad rap, or I know it's totally subjective and totally particular, is, is for me a method at trying to reveal the levels of, uh, the, the, the interconnection between unconscious, conscious, both feeling and the revision of affect that keeps us blocked from openness, and how that is linked to analysis. That's why I'm calling it emotional intelligence. I just want to come back to a statement you made that I appreciated, but I want to problematize it a bit. You said, I think, that one of the reasons for scientists and humanists to get together is to help each field be better what they already do. Okay. But in fact, in your work is a wonderful example. It's not making us better at what we do to bring in science, but it's totally changing what we do. And I don't know whether the reverse is true. Certainly, I see our field, you know, my field of literature and film studies dramatically changing. And now I, I sort of kept uh, the science appeal to cognitive germ at bay because I was very aggressive to science way, but the work I'm doing now with Alzheimer's and dementia in film, I'm finding I need to know something, the questions I want to answer that are leading me to want to know something about the brain. So I have been reading, and by the way, I don't know if any of you, you probably know the book by right? my colleague Paul Armstrong, How Literature Plays with the Brain. I think it's quite early on, right, in sort of trying to bring this question of what we does in the brain, as it were, as a very literary person. But so, um, and, and there, so, I, I, and so and the question is, are the humanity you mentioned it, or some of you mentioned about legitimate, legitimizing ourselves? Are we letting the pull of some of these very interesting science interconnections sort of take over what we used to do? And you mentioned close reading. I like to do close reading of film text, which, you know, is this old, 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 old method. You know, so, and I, I don't know how this work that I'm doing now with the brain is going to change that, or I still be, I'll be reading the films very differently. Um, I, no, I don't, I don't really have a point. I just, I just want, to keep, <laughs> I want to make the case that, that it's not keeping it as, we're not learning to be better at what we already do. We're very much changing, and probably for good measure. Yeah. Well, well, what I'm hearing you, know, you guys say is that, um, that there is, and it's very generous of you to say this, that insights coming from sciences are somehow deepening things that uh, you are working on, and there's reflections in brain imaging that may somehow um, feed into and form what you're already uh, working on. But um, a less generous way to say it is simply that uh, Neuroscientists are discovering what you already know. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, and it depends. I mean, sometimes I think you might be taking a defensive posture when it's unnecessary, really. Uh, yeah, I 
I think for me, though, just, and then maybe I'm just saying the same thing again. The, the little bit I'm trying to do with the terms of now, I think reading about this stuff is to be able to make legible statements to my students, myself, my colleagues in the field as well as elsewhere about why it matters. It's interesting. Uh, I mean, both Ken and I, was, uh, what's unusual here is we're both MDs. And if you think about like, what are humanity science interfaces that are particularly fruitful, the medical space is, is a really powerful one. And for us, I think a lot of it's probably driven just through patient care, because every patient is an ally, every patient is unique, every patient has an amazing care. And physicians know this, and it, and, uh, it drives you know, some of your motivation to do the science. So that's a, that's always a good for space. And then there's this the space of patient complexity and, and the diseases that drive them into the places they get to. There's still a lot more stories there to be told. And I think that's what you're discovering yes. in Alzheimer's, right? You're saying, oh my God, there's like 50 different kinds of right. And they can create this kind of person and that kind of person. And they're all narrative arcs. Mm -hmm. that Exploited or leveraged or celebrated, depending on how you want to do it. I mean, you know, then there are catalogers and all over sciences, but it's been a great catalogger, right? And how you can see all these kind of uh, varieties of the nervous system. So I think that, I mean, it's a, that is probably one of the reasons why we're here, because it's kind of drove our backgrounds. I'd like to just emphasize the point you're talking about patient care. Um, that what the patient is looking for most is the humanity of the physician. And that, I think, is the inescapable value of the humanities of ours to make us more human. Yeah, I, I, that's a great point. I was very pleased one time when uh, sometimes there's things that I might be doing or saying that the people in my department aren't so pleased with. And I was so happy that uh, my dean said, you know, you've got to let Ken go, he's an MD. Because <laughs> no one else might so um, I think there is this idea that uh, you know sometimes uh, medical training does uh, uh, allow one to walk in that inner space between the humanities and the sciences. And the it, 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 and admissions committees know this now in medical schools. They look for people who've been out a couple of years. They've done real world jobs. They they're English majors. They're music majors. They're not just pre med bio site, you know, uh, bottom of the box. Shall we continue over wide and cheese? Hmm? Sure. Okay, thank you.